Uh, hi everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So wherever time zone you are, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nalini Yelumalai. I'm the Malaysia Program Officer at Article 19, uh, based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, and this event, the press briefing today, uh, is co-organized by Access Now and Article 19. Um, so basically, we are here to discuss uh, and to get some overview on what's happening in Malaysia in regards to freedom of expression online. Um, so the, our title today is New Government, Old Tactics, Laws, Abuse to Throttle Online Expression uh, in Malaysia. Um, this event will be recorded uh, and will be made available in YouTube. Um, so we can share the link later. Um, and we also have uh, prepared a, a press statement for today. Um, and that will be shared shortly uh, for your attention. So you can actually make use of uh, for your reporting uh, with additional information from the speakers later. Um, and we have really good, excellent speaker from Malaysia to join us to talk about the issues uh, of freedom of expression in Malaysia. Um, I would like to introduce very, very briefly all the speakers and I'll pass to uh, each and every one of them to give more uh, detail, a uh, background about them. So our first uh, speaker on our list is Ms. Wat, uh, Watsala Naidu. So Watsala is the Executive Director of Center for Independent Journalism uh, in Malaysia. The second would be Mr. Edmund Bond, laureate Ahmed Bond and advocates a former IHR Malaysia representative. Mr. Stephen Gunn, editor-in-chief and co-founder of Malaysia Kini. And, and finally, Mr. Fami Reza, activist and artist. Um, so I would like to uh, give this floor uh, to Ms. Wachala to give uh, a very general overview of the state of freedom of expression and political situation in Malaysia. Um, Wachala, over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nalini. And hello to my uh, fellow panelists, our members of the press and friends who are joining us uh, virtually today. Um, and thank you as well to the organizers uh, for having me join the briefing today. Um, my organization, the Center for Independent Journalism, um, is a civil society organization as well as a media watchdog. And our work is grounded in promoting freedom of expression, right to information, and um, free media. So in that context, what I would share um, with, you, with everyone today is a snapshot of the freedom of expression landscape in Malaysia. And of course, this is located within the context of our continuing political turmoil, as well as COVID-19. In 2019, um, you know, following the last or the 14th general election, which actually resulted in the opposition coalition Pakatan Harapan coming into power, we saw more of an opening of space and also some level of cautious optimism, I would say, with regards to our part towards reform. Yeah? This, of course, um, all changed um, you know, at the end of February 2020 where through rather, I would say, unprecedented machinations you know, known here in Malaysia, and I think even now globally as the Sheraton move, we entered into a political turmoil, which you know, has resulted in a new government and a new coalition led by uh, Prime Minister Moedin Yassin. Now, this new government you know, formed through precarious alliances has resulted in a situation where the government is attempting to prop up its positions by stifling criticism and dissent. And this is what we are seeing. And on top of that, the government has used the COVID-19 pandemic to justify the very severe measures that it has, you know, has been adopting, the crackdowns, the intimidation, the harassments that we have seen. Yeah? And one of the most severe measure, I would say, is the actual pro proclamation of an emergency on 11th of January 2021 this, this year, right? which has, um, in effect, suspended parliament and has also um, empowered the prime minister to enact ordinances which circumvents parliamentary debates. Uh, what we have seen now, um, you know, amongst the few ordinances which has, uh, which has been enacted is the enactment of the emergency um, ordinance number two, um, which came into effect on the 12th of March, 2021, and which is actually intended to criminalize fake news 
uh, re um, relating to COVID-19 and or the emergency proclamation. So this is now has set the, 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 the landscape, the environment, you know, to curb freedom of expression and speech. Uh, being in this perpetual lockdown in some different forms of lockdown since March 2020, what we have seen is uh, a larger um, constituent of, or a larger number of people moving towards online spaces for communications, for exchange of ideas, you know, imparting or seeking information. This then is the, the back, a backdrop that has also set the trend and the pattern uh, or rather the prevalence that we see in the course of the last, um, I'll say 15 months or so of silencing dissent, various forms of expression. And this is actually to a large extent escalating because it's not just civil society, I mean, human rights defenders or media, or you know, there are also attacks against gender-based expressions, attacks and use of religion to undermine freedom of expression. I'm sure uh, my other uh, uh, panelists will also share more of specific um, incidences. So this is just to give a framework. I'm happy to respond to more questions, questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vachila. Um, I will now move on to Edmund. Thank you, Nalini. Article 19, Rights Con Access Now. Malaysia still labors under laws curtailing freedom of speech and expression. And we still uh, have the colonial legacy in the Sedition Act that allows for prosecution uh, on statements against the royalty and government. The Communications and Multimedia Act penalizes annoying and offensive posts on the internet. Fami Reza's experience is an example. The Printing Presses Publications Act regulates print media and books. The Home Minister has the absolute discretion to ban books it deems unfit for public consumption on the basis of national security and public order. The courts uh, still rely on an archaic uh, contempt of court law uh, that penalizes or uh, is used uh, purportedly to protect its uh, dignity and its institution. And uh, Stephen from Malaysia, Kini, uh, will elaborate on that example. But tellingly, the most uh, controversial enactment recently has been the emergence of the fake news ordinance under the emergency laws. It reenacts a law that was actually repealed by the previous Pakatan Harapan government. And it's now been revived uh, under the pretext of protecting um, or, or promoting the fight against COVID-19 in an emergency. There are at least five main objections against this fake news ordinance. One, it is too broad. Any information regarding COVID, any information regarding the emergency may be deemed as news that is fake and punishable under the law. Two, Anyone can go to court on an ex parte basis in the absence of the other party to have the court order remove that piece of legis uh, that piece of news that is purportedly fake. So you go to court without a challenge uh, for the the piece of news that that is on on the website. And three, if the applicant goes to court to seek that the article be removed, you cannot challenge it. No one can come to court and say, look, that order to remove is wrong. For the fine and jail penalty goes up to 100,000 ringgit and up to six years imprisonment, that's excessive. Five, any news portal or social media platform or third party commentators, intermediaries can also be liable under this law. And this is overly broad and is unproportionate or disproportionate and goes against any principle that we know of under international human rights law. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I pass to uh, Stephen uh, to share his experience as Malaysia Kini has been prosecuted lately um, for the third party comments on the news site. Stephen, over to you. 
thank you, thank you, Nalini, uh, fellow panelists and fellow uh, journalists. Um, I'm I'm the editor of chief, uh, editor in chief of uh, Malaysia Kini and also the co-founder, uh, which is a social political website uh, news website in Malaysia. We've been around for more than twenty years. Uh, Malaysia Kini went live uh, a year after Google uh, was launched. I think uh, well, we're not as successful as Google. Uh, we are one of the few startups that have done uh, pretty well, I think, uh, in this part of the world. Um, we are a subscription-based website, and our income uh, rely mostly on uh, the support of our, our uh, supporters and our readers. Now, working in an environment which is particularly hostile for media organization like Malaysia Kini has not been uh, easy for all of us. Uh, but somehow we are able to survive uh, through the years. We've been raided by the police. Well, last time I checked, it's about five times uh, over the years, uh, arrested a number of times as well. Uh, and we face debilitating uh, cyber attacks and the like. Um, the latest was the uh, contempt of court uh, charge against Malaysia Guinea, uh, where we will find a hefty uh, half a million ringgit. Uh, that's about... Uh, 120,000 uh, US dollars. Um, but uh, thank goodness uh, the amount was, uh, the, we are able to thankfully, uh, you know, able to raise uh, through crowdfunding uh, within a few hours. Um, now that that charge was uh, based on uh, comments that was made uh, uh, by our subscribers uh, in our comment, comment page, uh, comment section. And uh, apparently, uh, some of the comments were uh, uh, were, criti were critical of uh, the judiciary. Um, the judges were not uh, were not happy about that. Uh, it went straight to the federal court, which is the highest court uh, in the country. Um, so there is actually no recourse for appeal. Um, and uh, the, the, we were found guilty of that. Uh, uh, we were given a few days, I think three days, to pay that fine. And if we were not able to raise that money, um, we would uh, we would have problems uh, continuing uh, the, our you know the uh, the, organ uh, the our, our reporting. So so I think you know uh, basically uh, the, I consider that uh, perhaps you know the, an attempt to also uh, uh, to stop us from uh, from continuing on um, and uh, the, uh, there have been you know other uh, uh, cases of uh, of attempt of harassment and all that. Uh, thankfully, again, we are able to uh, survive that. Now, the many restrictive laws that uh, we face in Malaysia definitely do impede uh, our work. But I guess, however difficult the situation is, it um, does not stop us from uh, continuing our our uh, to carry out our task, uh, which is to tell the truth to power and uh, to uh, hold power to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Theo, and I think all of you really uh, sticking into the time frame that was given. Very well done on that. And Fami, I, uh, over to you now. And Fami has a presentation. So Fami. Thank you, Nalini. OK, let me play my slides. Okay, my name is uh, Fahmi Reza, and I'm a political graphic designer based in Kuala Lumpur. And I've been, for the past 20 years, I've been uh, producing hundreds, thousands of uh, political posters and graphics on different uh, social issues. On the screen right now, I just um, posted that I produced this year so far. Uh, back in 2016, I was charged in court for one of my graphics, a clown caricature of the previous Prime Minister Najib Razak, yeah, criticizing him as a, as a way to protest against his involvement in the 1MDB corruption scandal. And in 2018, I was sentenced to prison and a 30,000 ringgit fine over the caricature under the country's uh, Section 233 of the Communications and Multimedia Act, our country's uh, multimedia and internet law. Uh, and uh, I continue to use my graphics as a way to comment, as a as a commentary, as a social and political commentary on on daily issues, and also as a way to protest against the current uh, government, 
Perikatan National Government. Last year, I came up with this uh, parody, satirical, missing poster of the health minister. Um, we have a big cabinet with underperforming ministers. So yeah, uh, I use my graphics as a way to criticize and, and make fun of them. And I also did another uh, parody of a coupon code um, where ministers get a discount uh, for quarantine after they came back from overseas. And for the, because of these two posters, I was called in by the police um, in March this year. Yeah. So I was investigate. there was two investigation papers uh, open against me, again, under the country's uh, internet law, Communication and Multimedia Act. Uh, and also, they, use, also, they also used uh, another law um, investigating me for criminal defamation for both satirical uh, graphics. Uh, in April, I came up with this uh, satirical Spotify playlist called This is Dengkika. Dengkika means uh, are you jealous or envious? Yeah? That featured uh, the portrait of our country's uh, queen. So it's, a, it's an actual playlist with 100 songs with the word jealousy in it. Uh, 100 jealous songs you know, all in one playlist. And I posted it on my Facebook and I got arrested. The, 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 uh, the government sent 20 police officers, you know, to my house. They kicked a hole through my door, forced themselves in, handcuffed me, brought me to the police station. And I was um, detained um, in the police lockup overnight uh, for 24 hours over this Spotify playlist. And again, I was arrested under the Communication and Multimedia Act and also under the country's uh, Sedition Act. And that's not it, yeah? Uh, so I came up with this uh, satirical or parody of a, of a university master's degree certificate you know, for our Minister of Communications, you know, uh, who is also, it's basically to criticize this culture of uh, party hopping. Yeah, so we call them frogs, kata. So I came up with this uh, fictitious uh, National Frog University and awarded uh, our minister uh, a master of party hopping. And I also came up with a logo for this, for this you know, fictitious university. And... Uh, the university, people lodge police report against me. So, so this is one, and this is another, another caricature of the health minister, uh, and people lodge police report against me, and, and I was called in again for questioning last month. Um, again, use, they're using the Communications and Multimedia Act over uh, all these different postings. All my graphics I post on my social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, yeah, so this year alone, I've been arrested once, and currently there are five investigation investigation papers. You know, I've been called in by the police five times so far, and I spent one night in lockup um, over my political graphic satire. So, so, so I think uh, that is what's happening with me right now. Thank you. Over the back to you, Nalina. Thank you so much, Fami. Thank you, everyone, for uh, covering uh, the first round of uh, discussion on giving a little bit of background. But your struggle, your, your issues, and also overview on political situation and freedom of expression uh, in Malaysia. I'm just going to be more specific on issues that has been raised um, by all of you in the discussion just now. So. I'm going to go uh, first to Wachilak. Wachilak, Malaysia already had an anti-fake news in 2018. Uh, it was repealed by the Pakatan Harapan administration. Um, and, you know, uh, and we say that it's quite problematic to have such a law in this country. But again, now we have fake news ordinance coming back again uh, in Malaysia. And it's been already being used to charge and to investigate people for misinformation uh, or fake news. 
um, why do you think the fake news ordinance was uh, passed again? And and do you, in your opinion, do you think there's a there's an opportunity or there's any chance for the government to repeal it as soon as possible? Okay, um, thank you for the question, Nalini. We to contextualize it when the first fake news um, act was um, uh, adopted. It was to counter and silence critics by the, the you know, just two governments before us, yeah? And it was uh, repealed. And I think that was one of the most um, progressive move made by the, the uh, Pakatan Harapan government. But then if we bring it back to our current context, what we see is basically a government, you know, it's like almost like a house of cards, right? Very shaky foundation that can collapse if shaken or questioned too much. So this um, ordinance um, is another manifestation or rather a tool to stop any attempts of critical questioning or challenging the authorities of the state. I mean, that's clearly what is being used and it's being used against uh, lay persons, you know, the general public. If we look at the number of cases that's been investigated in the last couple of months, you know, 21 odd cases have been investigated. Um, I, I think almost 11 cases where um, they were probably um, charged as well. Now, so the avenues for repeal in the current context is rather tenuous, yeah, because it is a tool. It's not like any other legislation to serve a particular public interest. It's so, but the other opportunities, so, you know, rather than us pushing for the repeal or, you know, or creating campaigns for the re uh, repeal, what we are really focusing on is also to see how, you know, at the end of the um, uh, emergency proclamation, which is uh, at the moment, you know, meant to end in August, yeah, there is a possibility under our constitution where it shall cease to have effect six months after you know, the emergency proclamation ceases to be enforced. So that is one opportunity. But there is um, you know, concern that the avenues for repeals very, very limited because it's a political tool largely. Great, uh, thank you so much, uh, Watsla. Fami, I'm, I'm coming back to you on the same questions. What is your opinion on that? Why you think it has been bring back again? Why? Uh, maybe I want to share my problem with uh, this fake news law. Uh, you know, when, when I was charged and convicted in 2016 over Najib's caricature, the crime was actually, uh, you know, the, the, the charge sheet. Yeah, it says I was found guilty of creating and spreading online content that was false in nature with the intention of hurting another person's feeling. And I think my, my, my main concern is that it is not clear how this uh, fake, new, fake news law will determine what is false, you know, uh, false news or false content. Yeah. And, and, and I fear it could easily be used to silence uh, legitimate criticisms, you know, against the government and, and, and works of political satire and, and parody yeah, that the government does not like. So, so they, it could easily be used against me again. Yeah, thank you, Fami, for sharing that. And I think maybe that's one of the main purpose. Coming back to the human rights lawyer, um, Edmund, um, the question is like, um, why do you think, um, you know, using a, criminal, a law to criminalize a publication or disseminating of misinformation is, is a bad thing? I, I, there are two reasons. One, in Malaysia, we have more than sufficient laws to deal with issues that pertain to expression and speech. We have a lot of provisions in the penal code. And in fact, if we look at the, the, when, when the internet was actually established, the whole regime was actually established. Section 233 and 211 were actually provisions to stop mass marketing campaigns by companies. So we, the, the intention was to stop telcos, for example, sending you um, hundreds of SMSs in a month, asking you to sign up to something, asking you to take a loan, or banks are asking you to, to, to take um, facilities. So that idea was to stop that kind of harassment, that kind of annoyance. 
But now 233 has been used the wrong way. And we have seen how it's been used. There's so much analysis on it. Uh, the previous Pakata Harapan government promised to look into it and repeal it, but uh, did not and could not uh, do that. Uh, we also have, um, and remember, we also have the Printing Presses Publications Act, which actually already criminalizes false news. It's not fake news. It's false news. It's was in 1984 that it was enacted. It is not good law in the sense that I do not agree with that law, but I'm using that as a comparison because even in that law, 1984, when you want to prosecute somebody for false news, the prosecution has to show that the false news was being spread maliciously. There's an element of malice in spreading that false news compared to the current emergency ordinance which allows for the crime of fake news, the element of malice need not be required to be shown by the prosecution. If you remember the most, I think the most high profile case was the late Irene Fernandez's case where she had actually uh, sent out information on how detention camps were in Malaysia, immigration camps were in Malaysia, how badly the uh, the detainees were being treated and she was prosecuted under the Printing Presses Publications Act for so-called maliciously spreading those false news. So I'm saying that there is enough laws we should look at um, uh, how, how these laws are being implemented, not having new laws. But I think the second point, and we've always said this, you do not stop free speech. You do not stop expression. If you have issues like COVID, you have issues for public discussion, you counter news or you counter information with more expression and more news and let it be in the marketplace of ideas for people to decide what is something that they want to rely on and, or, or not. Back to you, Nalini. Thanks, Edmund. Thank you so much for the explanation. Just a reminder for journalists who have joined, uh, please feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat box or you can ask during the Q&A as well. Uh, but feel free to put any questions that you have. If, who, whoever's joined, uh, please feel free to start a discussion in the chat group as well. So uh, we will address that later on. Um, I'm coming to uh, Stephen. Um, Stephen, um, how could this law uh, negatively impact independent news uh, outlets, journalists, or civil society? And in the lead up to elections, and, and we can foresee elections coming up, maybe not this year or next year, but how do you see this impact um, on, on media, for example? Uh, thank you, Nalini. Um, as, as Edmund has already said, uh, we have uh, a slew of uh, restrictive laws in Malaysia. Uh, last time I checked, I think we have a couple of dozen of laws uh, that directly or indirectly impinge on press freedom and uh, freedom of expression. So uh, I guess, you know, with another law uh, being thrown into the mix does not really change the way uh, we work uh, as journalists. Uh, to be brutally honest, uh, we, we take it as just another hurdle uh, that we have to overcome uh, to carry out our task. Um, you know, the, the, there's already so many hurdles there. So this is just another one. Uh, no doubt, I think, you know, the anti-fake news law uh, gives the government another level of control uh, over, and it's not just, just the media alone, but it's also a, media, a, a way for them to controlling activists, uh, political, political dissidents, um, the civil society, and especially social media users. Um, but I think, you know, where there is repression, there will also be resistance. And I think farming is uh, an excellent example and uh, he's uh, an inspiration to, uh, uh, to many of us uh, Malaysians. Um, and while I think it is a little, a little harder to, to cow, you know, hardened activists uh, like Fami and, and also independent media uh, organizations such as Malaysia Kini, uh, it may not be the case uh, with social media users. Um, despite the many failings of, the, of social media, and I think you know, there's a long list of that, uh, we'll leave it to another discussion, but it's nevertheless a powerful, you know, a really powerful tool uh, for people to express themselves and to mobilize public opinion. 
Uh, this is what the government fear most. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the people as always will always find, you know, creative ways of uh, to circumvent such uh, restrictions and repression. So I guess, you know, the, I am optimistic, uh, though, of course, you know, situation is getting getting harder and harder and it's getting worse and worse and more laws are being, you know, being implemented in order to control our freedom of speech, uh, our right to express ourselves. Um, but I think, you know, the, uh, Malaysians will, as always, uh, will find ways to, uh, to, 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 you know, to overcome, you know, whatever restrictions uh, there are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thanks for spreading that optimism and good spirit to everyone. Yeah. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm coming back to you again. I would like to hear more from you. How did your work create debate or discourse in the country? And how do you think the problematic laws can impact, again, the debate and, and your work um, from right, requesting accountability from the government? Yeah. I think through my graphics, you know, graphic design, you know, posters and visuals and graphics are powerful medium of communication. And especially in the age of social media, it's so much easier for me to highlight and expose, you know, corruption and wrongdoing and abuse of power using, you know, my, my, my graphics to communicate directly to people on social media. And I think with all this, uh, you know, in act of police intimidation and arrest and suppression, I think it's going to create a culture of fear, you know, a chilling effect on, on every, everyday citizens, you know, from talking about uh, these issues, from exposing uh, uh, the, the corruption and abuse of power of, of, you know, the government and the people in power. Yeah, only, only the, the few who, who, are, who are brave enough uh, that is willing to resist and, and fight back and, and speak out. Yeah. So I think uh, it's not going to be good, you know. Um, when we have a culture of censorship and self-censorship, because in Malaysia right now, most people are still afraid, you know, uh, to criticize or make fun of uh, those people in power and political satire, you know. Uh, in Malaysia, it's, it's a much more dangerous game over here. You can get yourself arrested, you know, sentenced to prison for satire, you know, imagine that. And, but that's, that's Malaysia right now. Thanks, Fami. Um, Wachila, um, um, your, I want to hear your opinion. Like, we can see that beyond this ordinance, the other laws, including sedition, communication, and multimedia act, um, and computer crimes related to, uh, laws are being abused to curtail freedom of expression. Um, to what extent do developments in Southeast Asia also impact Malaysia and, you know, and vice versa? Like, whatever happening in Malaysia, how it could impact um other countries and yeah yeah okay. so the the two first what we need to look at uh, would be certain developments which resonate you know uh across all southeast asian countries um one is the infodemic uh second would be the proliferation of disinformation hate speech online gender-based violence yeah and this is you know the threshold might be different but this is very common, not just in the region, I would say globally as well. But what we have in common in this region is the concept of ASEAN brotherhood, yeah, where they tend to adopt a somewhat similar approach to mainly, I would say, human rights issues. Yeah. And if we look at it in three different areas, one is the political turmoil that we are seeing. Um, and, and relatedly, the human rights violations, right? Aside from what's happening here in Malaysia, we have the coup in Myanmar, we have authoritarian-like practices in, in Philippines, you know, that's all leading to prosecutions, persecutions, and other forms of human rights violations. We also see another pattern or, you know, a, 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 a common threshold, which is the continued use of repressive laws to criminalize expression, yeah? So not just in Malaysia, in Singapore, we have the Protection from Online Falsehood and Manipulation Act. Yeah, of course, in Thailand, we have the La, La Majeste Law. In Myanmar, there are attempts to, you know, blackout telecommunications, internet blockades, and so forth. Obviously, you know, the other countries like uh, Cambodia, La Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam also has different forms of laws that are being used to curtail uh, expression online, right? 
And then we have this added uh, intersecting element of the pandemic, which is you know, contributing to two things. One, it is because the countries um, and the different states are overwhelmed in mitigating the pandemic, there is some levels of silence or you know, and silence often can also amount to complicity, right? Uh, so there's less critical voices, even in the context of Myanmar, you know, uh, we would have expected uh, more of, um, you know, uh, or stronger voices and stronger interventions from Southeast Asian Strait, at least through the ASEAN mechanism. Then we also have the pandemic now being used as the reason to justify, you know, the use of these laws and the use of other severe measures to curtail expressions online and offline too. So the dynamics are, are quite common. You know, sometimes it's almost like having uh, you know, uh, the same models of laws being replicated across the different countries. And the worrying trend here is that you know, the, the relationship uh, amongst the Southeast Asian countries can also reflect in, uh, you know, Malaysia's participation, for example, at the global level. Yeah, so the, the commitments then, you know, this, this Malaysia's quest, you know, to, uh, you know, to uh, become a mem uh, member of the Human Rights Council and the upcoming or rather very diluted pledges that they have made are not convincing enough. But because of the development in the region, as the bloc, there's a possibility, high possibility that they are going to get elected. So these trends are common. These trends are also contributing to a situation where things are not necessarily going to change through, uh, you know, uh, further, how would I say, intervention, I, I mean, I won't say intervention, ASEAN don't really intervene, but for, uh, further response that are progressive from other countries, yeah? So, yeah, so that, that's how we are looking at it. If I may, just one minute, just uh, Nalini. And this also, I mean, what I would say is how these also manifest in, in media freedom, because media is often, you know, the first to be targeted, right? You target and you silence media. If you see what's happening to, you know, in Philippines, uh, and if you're seeing what's happening in Malaysia, even to a large extent in, in Indonesia, and of course, Myanmar is at a completely different level altogether, yeah? So this is the context, and yes, Malaysia definitely fits itself very comfortably within this context. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Watsila, and thank you everyone for sharing. And uh, I would just like to, before we wrap up, um, I would like to give two to, two, two to three minutes to each uh, panelist to, to just, um, what is um, the future of freedom of speech and expression in Malaysia? I would like to start with Steven. Stephen, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, well, uh, it's a good question. I think um, um, given the political landscape uh, uh, in Malaysia, where really, you know, yeah, we are going through uh, a culture war, so to speak, uh, just like in the United States, where, you know, yeah, we are split uh, right in the middle and there is no one political party that can, you know, or any one political coalition that can actually uh, has, you know, the, uh, 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 a stable uh, the political power. Um, I think, you know, the, you're going to see uh, a lot more uh, restrictions, uh, you know, looking ahead. I could not see I don't even think that the next general election will be able to resolve the kind of you know the, uh, uncertainties uh, the, that we are facing right now, the, with no no political parties being able to you know the, come out on top, uh, you know the, to 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 really claim that they have the majority of support among among Malaysians. The, we are, as I say, split you know the, in all different ways. Uh, so. The, um, and given that, you know, you're going to have weaker government, uh, they're going to feel a lot more threatened. And be because of that, uh, you see, you know, the more restrictive laws being implemented. Um, but, you know, I'm in the long term, I'm, I'm positive. I think, I think uh, the, 
uh, when Malaysia Kini started 20 years ago, Mahathir was in power and he was, you know, uh, and uh, definitely someone who does not brook any dissent. Uh, and, you know, at that time, we never even thought that there would be a change of government. Uh, I, you know, I myself do not think that uh, I would see a change of government in my own lifetime. So I think, you know, uh, in that sense, we see some progression there. Uh, the, the, that you know, the eventually uh, leading to a change of government. Unfortunately, that did not last. But um, but I I still I am confident that you know if uh, Malaysian continue to to work together, um, you know, the, and um, uh, find ways to uh, to overcome you know whatever uh, problems that we're facing, uh, whatever you know the uh, the problems that uh, the government is throwing at us. Um, we'll be able to uh, prevail again. Uh, so I think, uh, in that sense, in the long term, uh, eventually uh, we shall we shall win again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephen. Edmund, I I think that the efforts to curtail and censor speech and expression will always fail. There will be many attempts and we see it today, but with the internet now being quite free and, and, and so free, the, you, the, the government can do whatever it wants, but there will always be uh, spaces and ways and different means to express ourselves. Uh, with COVID, of course, we do not see a lot of expression on the street as much as we see it before, but we can see from what Malaysia Kini is doing and what Fami is doing uh, these efforts will go a long way towards encouraging uh, people and inciting people towards more expression and, and, and speech. I think the future is really to start creating or continue to create resistance writers. I think in Malaysia, there are not enough resistant writers. Uh, this was what Lawyer Broke tried to do uh, at that time uh, to get around. Hello, Edmund. Are you there? And we felt that when Lawyer Broke started and to where we, the different mediums of expression. So the point I think is, and what Fami is doing is really good because it's inciting a whole new generation of resistance through arts, uh, through writing. And this, I think, is the future. So we, as lawyers, uh, CSOs, we can only support, we can only uh, do what we can in terms of advocacy, but the frontliners are the people like Fami that we will always uh, back, we will always defend um, Stephen and Malaysia Kini because we know what is right. So it's not a question of that we will, we will, we will win. We are actually winning. The only question, uh, so I, I disagree, Stephen, I say we will win one day. It's, it's not that we win one day. We are winning. It's just, it just uh, depends on how you see it. And I can say from spending three years inside government, a lot of expression and speech when you stand inside government, uh, there is a lot of fear inside government. So what happens outside? Uh, and, and this is something that they have to deal with, but this is something that uh, is also on our shoulders to, continuing, uh, to continue the pressure and advocacy. Thank you, Nalin. Thanks, Edmund. Um, Wachila. Yeah, um, I would also, you know, like um, Stephen and Edmund, you know, take a positive uh, spin to what's actually happening now. Government's action is actually leading to or rather encouraging public, the lay person to occupy more of the spaces, especially online spaces, uh, to voice their dissent, right? We have also, and it's allowing us and giving us the space to mobilize more voices. So from the layperson to the youth, we are also seeing more resistance slowly, but yet as uh, what uh, Admin said, because of the pandemic it's small, but there are resistance through protests as well, you know, both led by FOE groups, but as well as youth groups. So this is really at times, um, uh, of critical times like this, we are seeing more of, um, you know, people wanting to act and it's sparkling more conversation and debate, despite the attempts by the government to silence uh, us, people are acting. And I think we are really encouraged by that. And we will continue to you know, ensure that these voices have the space um, 
and the necessary protection to move forward. Thank you so much, uh, Varshila. Um, Fami, let's hear from our icon. I think we should stop being afraid of the government, you know? Um, and I think we should start exercising our right, you know, to freedom of speech and expression, you know, clearly stated under Article 10 of our, of our federal constitution. Uh, and be prepared to be arrested, you know, for, for speaking out, for expressing yourself. Last Saturday, I conducted a, a Zoom workshop uh, for 13 graphic designers, you know, uh, training them uh, what to do if you get arrested by police, you know, educating them about all the different sections that are, you know, usually being used against graphic designers like us, you know, Decision Act, uh, Communication Multimedia Act, Section uh, 504-505B of the Penal Code, you know, and also training them uh, what to say to the police when if they if they get investigated um, and preparing themselves to, to be arrested. And I think this is one way for us to what, and, and basically, people need to know their rights. Yeah, that we have the right to, 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 to expression, to free speech, yeah. And, and if they want to arrest us, arrest us. We're not going to be afraid, you know. So take a stand and, and, and you know, uh, prepare to be arrested, you know, to defend our right to freedom of speech and expression. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for uh, all your contributions and your idea. Um, is there any questions from the journalists or anyone here? Uh, uh, feel free to ask to uh, any of the panelists or if you have any opinion that you want to share, feel free to share. Um, anyone, any volunteers? Hi, um, can I just jump in? So hi, my name is Devi and I'm Asia Pacific Council for um, Access Now. We just wanted to say that um, today we released with X Access Now Article 19 CIJ and Civicus um, a joint statement on these issues. And I'm just going to post it in the link there. And I would encourage you to share that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Devi. Um, any any uh, questions from anyone? Uh, Raman? I, I was told that you have a question. Yes, Raman. Carry on. We can hear you, Raman. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Apologies for that. I was going to say, and Ramanji seems to be more from Access now, but the question I wanted to ask was something that press colleagues in Malaysia and covering Malaysia have asked me. Uh, and which was that if you had like literally just, and this is particularly to uh, Edmund uh, Fami as well as Stephen uh, Vashila, if there was one thing that you had, that you would have Malaysian lawmakers uh, or judges do, note I'm not saying government minister, but if there's one thing you had MPs or judges do in regards to the current press freedom situation in, in Malaysia over the next two to three months, what would that be? I'm just curious on what you think some of these institutional actors in parliament and in judiciary could do in order to make the situation better. Anyone want to take up that? Yeah, um, maybe I can answer that. I think the demand from the lawyer side was when Pakatan Harapan took over government, and this is what they did for some cases, is actually to review all the cases that uh, have been initiated by the attorney general under these repressive laws, one. Number two, look at the laws, uh, of course, to repeal or at least to amend them. And I think if the Muhyiddin government uh, wants to, how would you say, curry favor uh, with certain groups of people, then this is definitely something which could be looked at uh, in terms of uh, human rights. Uh, I also want to add, that uh, what Stephen said about uh, a, a multi-party government, a weak government after elections, is actually a good thing. It's a good thing that we have a weak government. And if we accept that it is a weak government, then what has happened um, all, all the many years of 
different uh, democracy movements uh, that has led to a weak government is a good thing because this is what this is what we need we need a weak government and expression and speech going out to vote is something that may have caused this or could have caused this so it's a good thing that we're weak government Stephen I don't understand why uh, you are saying but I know why you're saying that's because you have a weak government then of course uh, there'll be more persecution uh, but I think we should continue to have a weak government and and all the efforts that civil society is doing uh, should be contributing to having a weaker government. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. I might disagree with that, but I, I leave it to the panelists. Anyone else want to respond? <laughs> yes, Stephen. Can I just jump in? I, I, you know, in some ways, I do agree with you. I think you know that uh, you you wouldn't want to have a government that 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 is so you know that is it is complete control of uh, that is doesn't fear about you know being thrown out of power. Uh, you know, uh, by uh, in an election, or whatever it is, and that's the case. And of course, you know, there is a uh, um, uh, the chance for them to abuse uh, their power, um, and uh, that is something that we have seen. Uh, you know, until recently, uh, you know, with uh, Barisan National, you know, having almost complete control over, over you know uh, everything. Uh, and uh, but I think you know my 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 thinking is in terms of the fact that uh, if you look at Pakatan Harapan it was, you know, uh, considered, you know, something that uh, is considered an improvement and all that. Um, and uh, they, 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 there is actually an attempt there to, to bring about some measure of uh, reforms, perhaps not as far as, you know, some of us may have hope, but at least, you know, the, there is talk about reforming, you know, repealing some of the restrictive laws, uh, amending some of the other laws, you know, the, and also the, for the media side, you know, the, also in terms of uh, setting up a media council so that uh, the industry industry itself can actually, uh, you know, the, regulate itself uh, rather than, you know, the, the, the government stepping in all the time and trying to, uh, you know, control the media. That if there's any, you know, any complaints or any unhappiness about our reporting, uh, there is actually an independent mechanism there that is, you know, that, that can actually handle those complaints rather than, you know, people going to the government and say, look, you know, you're supposed to punish, you have to punish these guys for uh, for overstepping whatever it is. And they have, they've been forced to, uh, you know, to, uh, implement, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, certain laws in order to control the media. So I think, I think in that sense, uh, 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 there were there were some attempts there. Uh, however, of course, you know, unfortunately, they, they didn't last long enough to uh, to bring about, you know, the meaningful reforms. Um, uh, and that's what I meant, really. I think, you know, the weak government, but hopefully a weak government that actually can last. <laughs> uh, uh, last, you know, long enough to be able to, to be able for them to implement uh, some measure reforms. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, anyone else have any, any questions or uh, anything? Yeah, can, I, can I answer yeah. a little bit? Yes, family. Yeah. So when, when I got arrested, you know, for last month, one of the police report was actually made by an MP from the ruling coalition. So I think besides repealing section 2T3 of the Communications and Multimedia Act, I think our MPs, you know, should, you know, uh, have a good sense of humor and stop treating, you know, any forms of political satire and parody against them as an act of sedition and defamation, you know, stop criminalizing satire and parody. Thank you. And what, Shala? I think there are two things, right? If we are looking at the judiciary, um, it would be, I think it's timely now for, you know, the Malaysian judiciary to really adopt judicial activism. You know, we, we've seen the ups and downs with the, just the decisions that, you know, even the federal courts come up with just the last few months, right? Uh, we, we are actually more inspired with what's happening in other countries, just looking at, say, for example, the uh, Madras High Court decision, uh, which bans um, conversion therapy. And the, the language is so progressive and the statements being made that it's so progressive. And if that is a way forward for Malaysia, I mean, even saying things like ignorance is no justification for normalizing any form of discrimination. I think it's already a stepping stone you know, for our judiciary, that's one. Now, to add on to what um, Stephen said about the need for Malaysian Media Council, it's actually very crucial because the, the state now has complete 
you know, powers over regulation of media. Yeah. And we have two sets of laws based on distribution mechanisms, right? We have, as what uh, Edmund said, PPPA, and we also have you know, uh, the Communications and Multimedia Act. So having a media council means that it will be an independent self-regulatory mechanism. Now, if we can actually get our parliament to, uh, you know, the suspension of parliament to be lifted and they reconvene, one of the things that we really hope that they'll put on the, and I say this very cautiously as well, right? We don't want this to be used as a tool by the current government. But one thing that we hope they will prioritize is to get the legislation uh, moving because there was already a pro tem committee established last year who's come up with their report and they've already also submitted a draft bill for the media council. I think that would be a crucial way forward to ensure um, you know, better standards for media as well as better regulation and more independence in its regulation of media. Great, thank you so much. Um, is there any other questions or anything? We have shared our press releases and uh, the joint statement. Um, and once the YouTube video is available, I'll send it on to the, all the media as well. Um, that would be perfect for reporting tomorrow, I hope. Um, if there's no more questions uh, and, and comments, um, thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that we had this discussion and uh, thank you Edmund, thank you Stephen, Wachala and Fami for joining us and, and really great to have this positive spirit in, 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 the, in the midst of pandemic. You know, so but stay negative in your, you know, in terms of your health, <laughs> you know, stay safe. And um, thank you so much, Fami, for reminding all of us that don't stop expressing yourself, you know, and be brave when you want to speak out. Um, with that note, thank you so much for everyone who joined. Um, see you again and have a right score, have a good right score event uh, until the end. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.